U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our fifth Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as host for today's event. We're very pleased to welcome Admiral Garvin and Mrs. Garvin with us this evening. The series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past years, it's been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport and around the world via Zoom. We will be offering five additional lectures between now and May of 2024, spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looking a bit ahead, on Monday the 13th of February 2024, Dr. John Maurer will speak about Churchill and Roosevelt. And Dr. Maurer is one of our absolute finest speakers, so if you have the opportunity, you may want to listen in on that. Okay, on with the main event. Uh, please feel free to use the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Holmes. Jim is one of the most prolific writers at the college and is known by almost everyone in the maritime security business. He holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the college, and he previously served on the faculty of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. A former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991. He later earned the Naval War College Foundation Award in 1994, recognizing him as the top graduate of his class. His book, A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy, is a primary selection on the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. I'm not exactly sure why, but former Secretary of Defense James Mattis considers him troublesome. His talk this afternoon will explain why it is so hard for the U.S. Navy to prevail in strategic competition or warfare in the Pacific, even though it reigns stronger than its competitors. I'm pleased to pass the baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Holmes. Yeah, Captain Jay actually, he actually uh, neglected an important part of my biography, namely he was my last boss in uniform in the United States Navy uh, here, here in Newport uh, back in 1995, I guess it was, 95, 96. So uh, I want to have a little tr have a little fun with the uh, with a very serious topic, na namely how we are going to do things vis-a-vis -vis China in the Indo-Pacific. And I want to, like I said, I want to have a little fun with it. Everybody loves zombies. I don't think, I think The Walking Dead may be off the air now, but boy, I tell you what, it had a, had a heck of a run. This is a, this, this talk goes back quite, quite a ways because the project that it's based on goes back quite, quite a ways. Uh, it was in 2010 that Robert Kaplan, whom you, you may be familiar with, who's uh, written books on the, the revenge of geography, wrote about the Balkans in the 1990s, and, uh, the 1990s and so forth, got in touch and said, would you do an article explaining how to count the size of a navy. Which sounds, I mean, which sounds like kind of a silly thing to, to spend a lot of time writing about. Can't open up uh, Jane's fighting ships, count up the ships, and that's, I mean, that's the size of the navy. But it's a, it turns out that it's a lot more complex than that. And I think this goes for all military services, but it, feel, it feels like it, it's even more pertinent to na naval services. And I'll explain why. And then I will, I will help you look at the Indo-Pacific and figure out what are the barriers in the way of the United States Navy and Marine Corps? How, I, how might we actually try to overcome those as we, as we head into this, into this de dangerous decade that we are in? This is the, uh, you can probably find this out there on the internet if you want to. It's about measuring power, 
combat power and not necessarily uh, counting up hulls, counting up numbers of sailors and, and so forth. So my, uh, my friend uh, Toshi Yoshihara and I did this for uh, Global Asia, a journal based in Korea, uh, back, in, back in late 2010. Uh, Toshi used to be on the faculty in, in our department, is now in the think tank world since uh, 2017. But I tell you, having done this, especially in election years, I feel like Rick Grimes. I feel like the Rick Grimes of sea power. You know how it is when you're fighting zombies, right? You take aim at one, you give it a headshot, it falls down, and 10 more just like it come shambling towards you. Shoot all those down, 100 more come in, ultimately you run out of ammunition and you're overrun. Bad ideas are kind of like, uh, bad ideas are kind of like undead ideas. You see, especially in election years, again, you see the same sorts of half-truths or, short, or shorthands for naval power come up and, and uh, partisans will, tr will try to uh, sort of oversimplify the question of how big, the, how big should the United States Navy be, how should it be configured, how many sailors does it need, and so forth. So my, uh, my not-so-hidden agenda for this afternoon is to recruit you all to my zo zombie hunting squad so that you ask the good questions this year, especially this being another election year, in which we're concerned about the size of the Navy. So this is something that I, I think, again, is, I think it's kind of fun, but it's also of real and present value. My agenda is pretty straightforward for the next hour. I want to take on a very simple agenda. First of all, I'll just, I will start with strategy. Look, look, at, look at the U.S. pivot to Asia, which is now over a decade old. This, uh, this basically means that the United States, because it sees the Asia-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific now, as its primary theater, it has shifted the bulk of its assets to the Pacific. Is that enough? That, that will be the second point I'll take on. And then I'll flip it around. We'll look at some geography and think about why it's so hard to wage away games, which is all the United States Navy, Marine Corps, and our, and our fellow joint services do. We hope not to fight here in North America, and therefore we try to fight in the rimlands, if we have to, of East Asia, of South Asia, or, or the Western Pacific. So, let me, let me launch right into it. The pivot to Asia was basically codified in a, in a, in a series of strategic documents uh, issued as long ago as 2007. The one, the one right there on the, on the left, the Cooperative Strategy uh, for 21st Century Sea Power, was unveiled on this stage where I'm, where I'm walking around back in 2007. It underwent a refresh in the middle document in 2015 and, gave, and then gave way to our current strategy on the right-hand side, Advantage at Sea, uh, in late 2020. But there are, there's, a, there's a set of coherent ideas that have been constants in all of, the, in all of these documents. I'm going, to reach back, I'm going to reach back to the 2007 document simply because it states them extremely clearly. But again, these, are, these ideas have persisted in U.S. strategy since 2007 at least. First of all, the 2007 document says the, the, the U.S. military, the Navy and the Marine Corps, reserve the right to project credible combat power in, theater, in theaters of interest, including the Western Pacific, the, the Indian Ocean, and the Gulf, which of course is an inlet in the Indian Ocean. So that's, a, so that's basically announcing, put in, putting the region and the world on, on notice that we, we intend to remain number one. Secondly, and this, is a, and this is a really striking claim, it's a, it doesn't really sound like it, but it really is. The, the document announces that we, the United States, reserve the right to take local sea control uh, pretty much of any body of water on the planet, of, on the planet Earth, preferably with allies, but, but perhaps not if, if, if our leadership opts to go it alone. I'd say, I mean, again, that's a pretty striking claim when you, when you consider the whole Earth's surface try, try to, trying to use your military forces to take, uh, take command of those waters and put, the, and put them to use for, for uh, uses that, that the political and military leadership deem wise. So, that's a, again, that's a pretty stun, a stunning thing to talk about. And lastly, this, and this was, this was kind of an innovation back in 2007, the, docu the cooperative strategy announced that that year declared that the United States, in concert with its allies, would be a multinational custodian of the system, basically the system of seagoing, sea uh, trade and commerce, and then obviously uh, political and military affairs as well. So again, and this is, where, this is where such ideas as the Thousand Ship Navy came out, the, the, the idea that you would have a multinational fleet that would police the seas against uh, things like we're seeing in the Red Sea today with, uh, with the irregular groups uh, launching attacks on shipping. Uh, piracy became a big, th a big thing back in, in the 2008 timeframe. So these were irregular, almost law enforcement challenges. Where it's a, whereas uh, in the Red Sea today with the Houthis, I think it's bleeding over into something that looks more like warfare. But again, yeah, these, are, these are sort of the big strategic ideas propelling what we are doing in the Indo-Pacific to this day. 
If you, if, you, if you fast forward to the Obama administration, uh, it put a, in 2015, one of my favorite documents, that they put out this document, the Asia Pacific Maritime Security Strategy. Why is it my favorite document? Because on page one it says, we preside, we, we, we safeguard freedom of the sea. That is job one in the, in the Asia Pacific, now the Indo-Pacific. What is freedom of the sea? We're always talking about freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation means mainly, it, it basically involves the freedom of a ship to go from point A to point B through, through some body of water, as, uh, as attested to in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and related documents. Freedom of the sea is a, is a whole lot bigger than that. Freedom of navigation is a subset of freedom of the sea, which includes uh, the rights to do such things as uh, underwater surveys, uh, to do things like uh, surveillance flights over the South China Sea, all the things that, uh, that uh, coastal states like China, like Russia, Iran, and now the Houthis object to. That, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into freedom of the sea uh, beyond uh, freedom of navigation. So, when you, so this, is, this is actually a much more uh, ambitious undertaking than simply safeguarding the right, to, uh, the right of passage through certain waters on the, on the globe. It's a, this, is a, this is a way of thinking, as I said, it, it's, it seems to be something that is bipartisan. This is, this is a Trump administration document in, in 2019, the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, which points out, it's, and again, it's, it, 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 it divulges the bottom line up front. This is our priority theater. And again, this is carried into the Biden administration as well. So it, it's, a, it's actually kind of heartening in a, in a time in which there's so little bipartisanship that there are some things that both parties can still agree on and, and, and work together to solve the, our problems. But, uh, and so, given the ambition of all, of all these documents and these ideas that are driving our strategy, operations and forces, the, 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 leadership, the leadership back in the, in the Obama administration resolved to, to have a 60-40 split between the Indo-Pacific uh, and, the, and the, the Atlantic and the other theaters of operation. So we, we shifted, to, in fact, this was underway even before all these documents were issued. By, uh, by 2006 or there, there about 60% of our submarine force was already in the Pacific and, the, and then various administrations codified that and kept moving surface forces, carrier aviation and so forth to the region. And that's, all, and that's all good. I mean, if you, if you have these commitments, you have to back them up with forces or else you're not likely to get your way uh, in concert with your allies and the leadership in Washington. So, which brings us to the, to the second point, is this enough? Yes, it's good to have a disproportionate uh, commitment to your primary theater. I mean, that's sort of basic strategy. Your, 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 your top commitments are going to command the most resources for the greatest amount of time. But that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, even, the, even this share of forces is, en is enough for you, for you to su succeed strategically. And this is where we start re becoming zombie hunters because you, you start seeing a series of ideas that, uh, that, uh, that get in the way, that get in the way of trying to get some sense of this and determine how much is enough. Do we, ha do we have enough out there to actually get it done? First, the, first, the first idea that I would uh, take, take issue with a little bit would be this one. The idea that, that whoever spends the most wins. You see it all the time in, in the popular press as well. It's all about the Benjamins. He who spends the most wins. Well, is that true? I mean, it's in, especially in election years again. This, this is an older one, but I guarantee if you got out on the internet, you could, you could find something like this. The United States spends more than the next X powers on defense combined. And therefore, the United States is in an unbeatable position simply because it has the most, the most dollars. Uh, the Financial Times had something uh, very similar to this just today in, in its commentary on the U.S. Navy and the U.S. military. I think that the figure's not top 14 anymore. This is, like I said, this is a bit older, but, but nonetheless, it dwarfs the rest of the world in, in terms of defense spending. I mean, that, that's not unimportant, but I, but I mean, think about what we spend on. This is, uh, this is one of three uh, Zumwalt cl class destroyers, which, was, which uh, visited Pier 2 on, uh, uh, yeah, I guess it was Pier 2, back, I think it was back in 2015 or thereabouts, head, heading south to it to be outfitted with its uh, combat system. We, all, we could only afford three of these things because they run about $7 billion a copy. It's a, it's a wonderful ship, stealthy, I mean, it's a, in all of these sorts of things, but nonetheless, that takes a big bite out of all that defense spending that, uh, that is encapsulated in the chart I just showed. USS Ford just, uh, just completed its, uh, its very first uh, deployment uh, to the Mediterranean Sea and to the North, North Atlantic. That ship, uh, I believe, ran about $13 billion, just the hull. 
That doesn't, that, that doesn't count uh, putting stealth fighters on it, a couple of squadrons of those, a couple, a couple more billion. It, it, it appears that it, by the time you put people, supplies, aircraft, all the things that an aircraft carrier needs to operate, that's probably, and especially if you, once you add in all the escorts that uh, keep it safe from harm, it, lo it looks like you're talking about a $20 billion asset. It's a, just, just by my sort of rough calculations. Anyway, but, but the, big, the point being, these, these are big ticket items, and they, and they, they take a huge bite out of that, uh, that huge uh, defense budget. Right across the, right across the bay at uh, Quonset Point, you can, probably, you can probably see it if you go across the Jamestown Bridge, we are, we are, we are working on the hulls for our next generation uh, SSBNs, ballistic, fleet ballistic missiles, uh, nuclear powered submarines. These are, I mean, they're gonna be, these, this is the Navy's top procurement priority by far. And we're gonna get a dozen of these at about $7 billion a copy. So again, more big ticket items. What about labor though? If you ever watch the old Top Gear, I think you have to, you have to think that this is sort of an emblem for, uh, for, for our labor costs in the US military. It's been a, uh, the Stig. Of course, he was a professional race driver and did all sorts of silly stuff while uh, road testing uh, supercars and hypercars. But, uh, in a sense, in a sense, our workforce is, uh, is like this. It's been estimated that the People's Liberation Army Navy can put eight to nine sailors in uniform for the cost of one American sailor. So most institutions, uh, labor is going to be their biggest expense, and I think, and I think that's something else that's going to eat into eat into our defense budget vis-a-vis -vis our, our our potential uh, adversaries such as China and Russia. So again, the, a, lot of the, a lot of this really sort of offsets the idea that he who spends the most wins. So I mean, the, the, this is not unimportant again, but it does, it, it's far from telling the whole story. The, uh, the second one I would point to is the idea, I, I would call it the idea that he who weighs the most wins. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, here, right on, here right, on, right on this stage is uh, Robert Kaplan a few years ago talking, talking about this and contending, talking about the nature of the United States as a maritime nation and so forth, but then contending that the, the U.S. Navy is the largest Navy in the world by far. And the Coast Guard, and co the Coast Guard by the way, would be the 12th largest Navy in the world uh, considered as well. Uh, Jim Fennell, former uh, Pacific Fleet Intel chief, would take, would take issue with that. He could, in, this, uh, in this very good book out of the U.S. Uh, Naval Institute Press a few years ago, he, foreca he forecast that the, the PLA Navy, the China's Navy, will number about 500 ships by uh, 2030. And it seems to be tracking uh, toward, towards that rough, that rough goal. What about, uh, oh, here we go. The, the, here's, the, here's the numbers as of, as of last year. This is, a, the, this is the 21 tw 21 edition of the Pentagon's report on Chinese military power, estimating that the PLA Navy would number 355 ships today. They made that. 420 by 2025. And again, they, they have a somewhat lower estimate, but still, we, we, we're lingering a little, bit, a little bit south of 300 uh, hulls in the fleet, and China, China, China is uh, cranking out hulls like sausages. Here's, a, here's something of Mike O'Hanlon, another one of the greats in the field, had, had, to, had to say at a, at a conference down in Washington about this. And he's, here, here's where he actually gets at it. Uh, yes, the U.S. Navy, he contends, is bigger than China's because of tonnage, meaning, me, meaning how, much, uh, how much water each, uh, each uh, hull displaces, how big it is. I mean, basically how, how much it weighs, if you want to really over, oversimplify it. And uh, I mean, that's, again, that's not an unimportant uh, metric, but, but, but at the same time, it, it doesn't tell the whole story, story, not even close. So what though? Well, I mean, if you, if you take this to extremes, if, you, if tonnage is the measure of naval power, then this is one of the most powerful warships in the world, the Emma Maersk out of, out of Denmark. It's a, it, it displaces about to, uh, five times what the USS Ford, our, 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 our latest aircraft carrier does, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's obviously an absurd statement, though, because this is an unarmed freighter. But nonetheless, that's where the, that's, that's where the logic of talking about uh, tonnage as being all important takes you. So again, it's part of the picture, but, but uh, far from being the entire picture. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean think, think about the, is, uh, is, would, was Coach Belichick trying to recruit this guy to the Patriots? Maybe, I mean, given the way his tenure wound down, perhaps he was, but uh, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of mass there, but it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of football capability. If, the, if this is the metric, I mean, if this is the metric for, for, uh, for weight, for physical bulk translating into combat capability, I'm good with this. I mean, if, if the US Navy and Marine Corps can give China's Navy a, a wedgie, I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. And I, so, so, I, so I would urge you to look at things a little more deeply, ask the hard questions about this. Yes, tonnage is important. It means our ships are bigger. They can carry more fuel, which they have to because we're operating far from home, more munitions, more, more of everything. But again, it doesn't translate into a, a one-size-fits-all estimate of how strong or, or uh, numerous a Navy is. So he who weighs the most need not win. The next one I would, I would put, the, I would put this, the emblem of, of this on it, or put the image of this on it, which is, this is the, this is the US uh, uh, the Great White Fleet, which circumnavigated, circumnavigated the globe from 1907 to 1909. And I would use that, again, I would use that to represent a debate between numbers of hulls. You're gonna, I guarantee you're gonna hear that as, as uh, the politics of, a, of, a, of the election year wind up this year. In fact, you hear it pretty much every day. The first one, the first one is, uh, is, is just basically looking at brute numbers of hulls and saying, look, the United States Navy is now smaller. It is smaller than it has been since 1916 when it first launched into, uh, uh, into its bid during the Woodrow Wilson administration to become a world-class a, a world Navy, a Navy second to none. So you, hear, you, know, you, will, hear, you will hear this uh, talking point this year, the smallest Navy since 1917. And that sounds, that sounds pretty dire. It, this, uh, this, uh, this way of thinking generally comes from the right, uh, from the right side of the political aisle. Uh, as as uh, Senator w Wicker of Mississippi, uh, representing a big shipbuilding state, li likes to say, and again, there it is, small, smallest Navy since World War I. That sounds pretty dire. You'll get pushback from the, from the other side of the political aisle, such as from our former uh, uh, Navy Secretary, uh, Ray Mabus, who was uh, President Obama's secretary for the entire eight years. And he pushed back against this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of thinking, and he says, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, we have, we have fewer ships than since 1917, but each individual ship is vastly more capable. And that's certainly true. I mean, you, you, could, you could put the U.S., so you, if you, you could put a, the U.S. Atlantic Fleet or Pacific Fleet up against the Great White Fleet, and I guarantee you it would, it would prevail. The, uh, the Great White Fleet would never even get, get off a shot because we would, we would dump missiles on it. So, that, so I mean, so this, this, this makes perfect sense. Except that it's not 1917 anymore. Think about the operational environment that this, that this much more modern fleet operates in. It has, to, it has to face off against things like this, China's J-20 stealth fighter. It has to face off against shore-based uh, uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, some of which are being used in the Red Sea today, anti-ship cruise missiles, land-based land uh, strategic and tactical aviation. All of these, all of these sorts of things are part of a much more difficult strategic environment. So it's, kind of, it's, so it's actually kind of misleading to compare the Navy today to the Navy a century ago. You have to, you have to rate it against what it's actually squaring off against in the Indo-Pacific to, to, uh, to figure out whether it's actually, uh, actually good enough. Yeah, uh, CNO Franchetti, our new uh, Chief of Naval Operations, got, in, got into this discussion a couple weeks ago, uh, speaking. Well, she released, she released a one-pager stating her priorities for the Navy, and she, then she, gave, she gave a talk at the Surface Navy Association and basically said, look, she's, uh, she's not obsessed with numbers. It's about what she calls a warfighting ecosystem. Do we have the, enough, the ability to put the right amount of combat power on the scene at the right time of battle in order to outmatch our foes? And, and she's right about that. I mean, she's, she's, basically, she's basically getting to the, to the right way of, of looking at this. It's, a, it's not necessarily all about numbers, and, but, and it's, it's really about the mix. Can, can you actually do what strategy requires and outmatch your adversary? So I, th this would be the takeaway from that one I would leave you with. Numbers are, numbers are not insignificant, but they also aren't everything. This, uh, I, I would, uh, sort of the obvious thing to, to do when you are trying to estimate the capability of a Navy would be sort of flip, up your, flip, flip open your favorite uh, book about navies, Combat Fleets of the World out of the Naval Institute, or Jane's Fighting Ships, which has been around forever. And, and then just look at fleet on fleet uh, configurations. Who has, who has more ships, who has more missiles, all, all the things that make uh, uh, fight, fighting navies uh, lethal to one another. And it, it, this, this too seems to make sense. I, I would give you this, this image right here. I think this is, uh, this is an image that, of a battle that's been studied a lot here at the War College and has been replayed here as, as recently as 2016, the Battle of Jutland in the North Sea in, uh, in World War I. 
when indeed you actually had navies facing off against each other uh, far away from shore fire support, and thus basically just having a navy on navy battle, sort of in the sort of in the classic sense that you would that, that you would assume fleet actions would take. But in this in this age, it's simply not that simply not the case that uh, battles even at sea, t take place solely be between navies. It's not even just, it's not even just, nav it's not just fleets, it's not even, not even just navies anymore. Shore-based shore -based services are reaching out, out to sea with shore-based uh, sensors and, and, and war-making implements to a, to a greater and greater degree, and that's a, that's a serious problem for us in the, in the naval services. I mean, think, think, about, uh, think about PLA, Air, for Air Force aircraft all packed with, uh, with anti-ship cruise missiles and equipped to, to venture out into the Western Pacific and do us harm. This, uh, this, this is part of the equation as well. It's not just the PLA Navy, it's also the PLA Air Force. It's also the PLA Rocket Force, new, newly organized a few years ago, which, uh, which, boasts, which boasted, it actually hasn't used them yet, but it was the first to create anti-ship ballistic missiles. This is the DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missile. It is reportedly able to reach out about 900 nautical miles from China's seacoast uh, and strike moving ships at sea. That's something that we haven't had, to ha haven't had to deal with in the past. And again, this is part of the combat power equation as well. This is the DF-26. This is a, much, a, a more modern and, and much longer range version than the DF-21D, another anti-ship ballistic missile. This one, the Pentagon tells us, can reach out about 2,000 nautical miles uh, from, from Chinese seacoast and again, touch us and do us harm. So this, this, this too is something you have to factor into the sea power equation when you're trying to figure out uh, who will actually win a naval engagement. Just to, just to take a map out of, the, and if, if you're interested in, in missiles of all types, the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, down in Washington, D.C. has a family of pages like this for all the major contenders. But uh, these are the, the rings around China, these are reflect the ranges of different missiles reaching out, reaching out from, the, from, from, from fortress China, from the, from the Chinese mainland. And look at, Look at all, wow, look at all the real estate that, those, that the DF-21, uh, DF-21D, the inner ring there, and the DF-26 can, can actually reach out and overshadow, if indeed they can find us, target us effectively, and put, and put that ordinance on target. The, unfortunately, the geography doesn't come out, to, come out too uh, clearly, it's kind of it's gray, but uh, the, 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 inner, the inner ring actually overs it, it overshadows all of Japan, much of the South China Sea, uh, and into the Arabian Sea. So there's even an Indian Ocean uh, aspect to this. The DF-26 DF actually overshadows Guam. It reaches out well beyond the second island chain. And thus, if we, take, if we get in a scrap with China, we will, try to re re we will try to unify the Pacific fleet that's already in the theater with, with units coming from the west coast in Hawaii. At that point, as they steam westward, that, this, is, this is something that uh, fleet commanders will have to take into account, simply because they could come under fire long before, before they even reach Guam, let alone, let alone a battleground such as the Taiwan's, Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, or East China Sea. So again, this is a, this is a major this is a major game changer. But it's not just a shore-based missiles. There's a there's a fan there's a family of uh, of systems or, uh, of small craft that are able to venture out into into some of those same waters and and, and actually again performed uh, perform sentry duty, strike at the U.S. Pacific Fleet, slow us down, uh, sap the energy out of our advance, and and in the ideal case, keep us from ever even getting to the battlegrounds. I like. I left this one, this is kind of an old one, but I, I love the lurid graphics. Basically just, show, basically just shows how U, U.S. forces approaching the theater will get into more and more dense uh, defenses, Chinese defenses that they will have to cope with as they, as they approach the, the likely battlefields in, in the Western Pacific. So again, it's a, so this is a, it's, an, it's an intensifying problem in the Western Pacific. And you, if, you follow the, if you follow the news, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with, with some of the things that have been going on in recent years. Over the past decade, uh, Ch Ch China has actually manufactured artificial islands in the South China Sea out of undersea sea mounts or, or rocks and so forth, and fortified them. This, is, this, this became a real problem during the Obama administration and it has only gotten worse. It's this, competing, competing for control of the South China Sea is a daily thing for, for China. And yet, yeah, I, I would argue that uh, Chinese sea power goes even, goes even beyond the PLA Navy, the PLA Air Force, and the PLA Rocket Force to encompass uh, paramilitary forces, law enforcement forces, including a maritime militia embedded in the Chinese, in the Chinese fishing fleet, which is fast. 
These are, these are the implements that uh, China use, uh, uses to stake its claims to maritime territory, especially in the South China Sea, but also around, but also around the Senkaku Islands uh, just to the northeast of, of Taiwan. This is, the, this, this is how they outface uh, China's much weaker Asian neighbors. And, this is, and that's something that, something that we really have to contend with. Of course, and of course, the China, the China Coast Guard, you can see that in the background, also the, the world's largest Coast Guard, protecting these, uh, protecting these assets as they stake China's claims to maritime territory. So it's a, I, the takeaway I would leave you out of this one is the strongest fleet may not win, but it's the strongest force. Made up of all these different ele elements of maritime might, that is, that is what's going to determine uh, who, who will actually outcompete or, or, or actually defeat one another if we actually get in a fight in the Western Pacific. As Einstein tells us, not, a, not everything that we can count counts, not everything that can, can be counted uh, can, can be counted, or counts, rather. I had to trip myself up there a little bit. But yeah, so, so go, beyond, go beyond brute numbers, I guess would be the takeaway from Einstein in this. If you sum up all these bad ideas, or at least these partial ideas, uh, these, these shorthands, thumb rules, whatever you want to call them, you get, to, you get takes like this uh, out, of, uh, out of John Mearsheimer, people like John Mearsheimer out at the University of Chicago in, in a very, in a very well, well regarded book uh, not too long ago. This is, this, is how he le or this is one of the passages he led off with when talking about the tragedy of great power politics. And here's what he says China, China does not possess significant military power. Why is that? Because its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. It would be making a huge mistake to pick, the, pick a fight with the United States nowadays. And he, Mearsheimer actually seems to think that that is the, that is the key point, that China, Chinese forces are inferior to those of the United States, and therefore, it's, a, it's utterly outmatched. But I think, I, I think we've seen that uh, China, has, uh, China has mass on its side. It has a whole lot of different systems. It's playing on its own home field uh, in the Western Pacific, so it has interior lines. It, it has a variety of advantages that go to the home team. So even if, even if Chinese forces are not as good as ours, and I don't think they are, on a, on a hull for hull or airframe to airframe basis, nonetheless, these advantages are things that, that help China offset those. And I think, that, I think trying, to, trying to piece together who, who, who actually has the advantage in the Western Pacific is, is, is sort of where we are right now. But uh, yeah, so be very, be very, be very careful about uh, take, hot takes like that out of academia because away games are hard and that's what we play. I would be remiss as a strategy professor at the Naval War College not to cite our deity, Karl von Clausewitz, out of, uh, out of 19th century Prussia, out of, who, who fought, against, uh, fought against Napoleon, took part in the, in the, in the French Revolutionary Wars, and, and so forth. He makes, a, he makes a, very, a very simple point about strategy, and it's this. The best strategy is to be really strong. I mean, go to Gold's Gym, sp spend a lot of time uh, working out every day. But especially, and this is the key point, make yourself stronger at the decisive place and time where the battle will take place. Which is, which is kind of, which is kind of, it sounds kind of like uh, buy low, sell high type stuff, but it is surprisingly difficult to actually, to actually make yourself stronger at the decisive place and time. Nonetheless, he says that uh, this is the highest and the simplest law of strategy. Stay concentrated and improve your likelihood of being stronger where it matters and when it matters. And here's, here's, how, here's how, he, how, he, how he sums it up. It's all, it's all about, even if you're not absolutely stronger, I mean, even if your entire force as a whole is not, is not stronger than your adversaries, if you can make yourself stronger at the decisive place and time, that's, what, that's really what it's all about, as far as getting your way in a particular battle or engagement. So again, so a contender can be globally inferior, but locally superior, and that's really what it's all about. It's about being stronger where it matters and when it matters. Well, I mean, this is a difficult thing. This is a difficult uh, theater to fight in, to, to fight an away game in. Curtis, if you have our friends at Google Maps, this is, I'm looking at, I mean, just look at that empty theater. That is the Indo-Pacific. Indo you can see Japan a little bit. You can, see, uh, you can see the US coast a little bit, but wow. That is, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's just a large expanse to try to fight, ac fight across, not even to, to just from a, in terms of combat power, but logistically. I mean, think about all the logistics assets you need to, to, to actually carry uh, fuel, munitions, uh, food, all, uh, supplies of all sorts to two battlefields that are, that are thousands of miles away from the United States. But that's okay because we know that zombies can swim, so this, so this logic actually transposes to the Western Pacific. This is a huge theater, again. 
Here's a, here's a, ma here's a map. Of, and by the way, if you, if you like uh, political cartography, these are these images I'm going to show you in the next few slides are, uh, are, out, there, are out there for you to right click on on the internet from a, from a gentleman by the name of Richard Eads Harrison. Uh, in his 1940, 1943 book, uh, A Fortune Atlas of World Strategy. He, he really excelled at sort of looking at, looking at the worlds and telling us messages by looking at the globe from different altitudes and, and different angles. And here he's, here he's just making the point that, uh, wow, that's what, that's what Japan, Imperial Japan, uh, bit off during the Second World War. Uh, try, try to encircle and, and, make, and, and make all this geographic space into its own, both the land masses, the water, and so forth, in order to extract those natural resources it thought it needed in order to accomplish its goals in the world. So again, huge theater, tends to spread things out, and it makes it very, very difficult to project power. But uh, there, is, and there is a bigger theater in the world, and this is it. It's a, look, at, look at that. That's, a, that's, the, the, that's the, the theater that uh, Harrison was calling out. But uh, where, does the, you know, where does the U.S. military operate? That's our theater right there. I mean, it's, it, it's really, really hard as a global power to, to actually, and we're seeing ourselves being stretched all around all the Eurasian perimeter to, to this day, I think, I think underscoring this point. The point, I, the point I'm making for you is that China, China remains concentrated. It keeps its force concentrated mostly uh, close to what it cares about, which are things in the Western Pacific, Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, East China sea. whereas the U.S. military, we tend to spread out simply because we have taken on commitments all over the globe, commitments to uh, de demand package of military forces. As, as, you, as you thin things out, as you disperse forces all over the place, chances are each individual packet of military force assigned to some contingency uh, is going to be weaker and weaker simply because you're trying to spread things, spread things out in order to uphold all these commitments. So China is concentrated. We're spread, we're spread out. This translates into, into advantage for China. As we see Charlton Heston saying, and again, repeating that Clausewitzian law, the highest, the 11th commandment, the highest and the simplest uh, law of strategy is to stay concentrated, and yet that is really hard for a global power such as the U.S. As the US. So, yeah, so again, try, trying to concentrate at the, at the place and time of battle is really, really hard. It's easier said than done. Think about it, think about it if we do do that. What do, I mean, strategy in, in, a, in a very real sense is a process of setting and enforcing priorities among commitments, which implies that you pick your top commitments and you demote others. But yet, yeah, there are opportunity costs to doing this. We, I mean, we're finding this out to, to our chagrin today. We, if, you, if, you, if you take a lot of forces, if you put even more forces into the Indo-Pacific, that makes you weaker in the Eastern Mediterranean where fighting is raging. Uh, it's, it's making you weaker, weaker in the Red Sea. It's making you weaker in the Persian Gulf uh, and the Arabian Sea, other, other theaters around the Eurasian periphery, which is really where, where the action is. So, this is, this is kind of how these debates unfold. It's really, really hard to, to actually do what strategy says and demote commitments because every commitment has a, has a constituency, it has a, it has a logic to it. It's just, it's just hard for uh, top decision makers to, to actually pull the plug on anything. The uh, distance, there's a tyranny of distance. Here's, a, here's another, another map out of World War II from Richard Eads Harrison. And he's, made, he's making the point about, boy, look at the, Man, look at, that. look at the lines from the, the U.S. East Coast and West Coast to try to get lend-lease supplies to our allies before the United States actually, jo actually joins the war. So again, man, that's a, this, is a, this, this simply imposes a lot of, a lot of rigors, a lot of, a lot of uh, strain on U U.S. logistics, as, as, well as, uh, as well as armed forces actually trying to make their way to important theaters uh, far from American shores. So looking down, looking down from the pole, it's a, it's a pretty sobering picture. How do we do this? Well, I mean, here's, here's, another, here's another thing that cuts into that massive defense budget. You have to have what, what, basically what you might uh, actually describe as boosters. You almost have to have boosters in the form of, in the form of uh, base networks in order, in order to provide that logistics to allow uh, task forces, uh, naval forces and our, and our fellow uh, joint forces to operate across uh, vast distances. This is an old picture of, from, from the Cold War of uh, Honolulu. As you, as you can see, it's a pretty uh, Pearl Harbor is a pretty extensive, uh, a pretty extensive uh, facility, and I don't think it's gotten any less since then. In fact, I would I would go so far as to reach back to I, I would reach back to uh, to your basic physics from college. Remember the adverse square, squares law? It tells you that a radiation source. If I'm trying to radiate something the intensity of that radiation drops off, not just sort of, not just sort of gradually as, uh, as you get farther from the source, it, go, it goes off by the square, by the square of the distance. So for example, 
uh, at, uh, at 2 R on, on this on this on this graphic, the, the intensity is one quarter is one quarter what it was at the at the outset. And I think I think trying to pro to radiate trying to project military po power across distances, it feels sort of like this. It's, so again, you have to have some, some way to boost to provide the occasional boost to that to that. Uh, uh, to those task forces in order to in order to keep their energy up so that you can re actually reach th the the scene of battle. So, one one thing for Clausewitz, uh, one thing for Clausewitz to say, concentrated the important places on the map. But again, it's really hard to do. As he tells us that uh, the simplest thing is is difficult in war. Uh, or I'm sorry, everything is simple and more, but the but, but the uh, the simplest thing is difficult, and he's absolutely right about that. He saw it in, he saw it in his own own lifetime on on European battlegrounds. The uh, the other aspect to this, I haven't even all I've talked about is basically the, the basically the geographic obstacles to uh, to to waging away games. But the adversary is not a potted plant. The the adversary has has as many brain cells as we do, as much desire, if not more, to win in battles in its own backyard, uh, and on and on. It will try to thwart what we want to do uh, on on some particular on some particular battlefield. For example, the uh, and this is, this is actually out of a peacetime context, but back in 2002, there was a, there was a famous, or, or maybe an infamous uh, military exercise in the Persian Gulf, or relating to the Persian Gulf. And this gentleman, uh, Paul Van Riper, General Van Riper, was assigned to play, well, he was assigned to play Country X, but it was Iran. It was, a pretty, it was pretty clear it was Iran facing off against a U.S. carrier uh, task force out in the Persian Gulf. And, he said, I mean, this is the quintessential red team. In fact, he's sort of the face of this wonderful book uh, by Mike Zinko a few, year, a few years ago, The Red Team. What is, how does the red team think? What does it do in order to thwart my, bit, my will? Keep me from getting what I want. Well, he did, he did wild things. I mean, the, 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 uh, the US uh, task force actually deprived Iran of uh, electromagnetic communications. So he was doing things like sending uh, engagement orders through mosques and stuff like that. I mean, just using all the resources at his disposal to their, to their best advantage. And he actually won. He, uh, he actually used all these shore-based these shore uh, weaponry in concert with the uh, regular and irregular naval forces and defeated the task force. And so, but the, the takeaway from Millennium Challenge, exercise Millennium Challenge, was the, the Navy actually changed the rules so that he lost. And he resigned, he resigned from, the, from the exercise and disgust and so forth, and uh, it, became, it became a real debacle. But nonetheless, this, this is a good face. If you, if you can think about this sort of experience and assume that, you, that real potential red teams will have as much ingenuity and desire to win as Van Riper, I think that's a, that's a good way to think about going into somebody else's backyard and, and trying to overcome them, much as, a, much as the great Bruce Lee had to in Fist of Fury, one of, one of the all-time all classics. It's just not easy to go into somebody else's dojo and win. The, uh, the other aspects, other advantages that go to the home team, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a famous sign down at Texas A&M University where they think they invented the 12th man, basically, basically having a fierce home crowd that makes things really difficult on a visiting team. So maybe uh, keep, uh, keeping the quarterback from hearing the signals or the, or the other players from hearing the signals. Just, I mean, think about all those things that go to the home team advantage. I would say, I would say these, this advantage applies many fold more, more than on the sporting field uh, in uh, military affairs. Or Cameron, uh, Cameron Auditorium at Duke University where they, they're called, the, the home team is called the, the Cameron Crazies because they're so insane to, to, to cheer for Duke. And again, try to, try to make things difficult on Looks like maybe a Boston College player. I can't really tell who that is, but pretty a pretty tough place to shoot free throws. Here's the, and the one reason I say that uh, I think the, the home team advantage is much more in military affairs than it is in sports is because it's unregulated. I mean, it's more like the WWE. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, there, yes, okay, all right, there's a referee there. Doesn't look like he's enforcing the laws. I mean. There's nobody going to regulate military conflict in the Western Pacific. I mean, it, it behooves you to bring all your stuff, make, your, make it an unequal contest, because there's no one to referee who, what you bring to the battlefield and how you use it. So to, to, me, this, to me, this is actually a, be, a better metaphor, a better sports metaphor than a basketball or a football, simply because, simply because, I, think it, uh, because I think it conveys that aspect, that you, that you should try to make it unequal. Because the enemy gets a vote. The enemy is not a potted plant, and the enemy will cast the vote against you, obviously. As this Iraqi lady would uh, remind us from, from the elections in 2005. What would Mahan say about this as I, as, I, as I wind down? I already mentioned one of our holy of holies, Clausewitz. 
This, this of course, is another one, our second president, Alfred Thayer Mahan, from back in the 1880s and then again in the 1890s. I guess he was my, I guess he was my and uh, Captain Jay's uh, most distant uh, ancestor as a strategy professor here at the War College. And he gives a, uh, he gives a, he gives us a simple, he gives us a simple way to think about this. How do I actually make myself stronger than the opponent at the time and place of action? And I want to do Hey, this looks really simple. It's a broad, form. I mean, it's, but let me, let me break it down yet for you just a little bit. It should, it should be great enough to take on the largest force it might encounter. This, I think, throws us back into, to, into, into the first half of the talk here where I was talking about how to measure, how to, how to measure naval strength. So uh, great, great enough, that would be uh, such, such, uh, such indices as numbers of ships, uh, number, I mean, how, how well armed they are. Can they, can they reach out? I mean, what are the ranges of their weapons and so forth? So this would be sort of the standard net assessment type stuff for the friendly force, and then obviously, and then obviously for the opposing force as well. How, how well prepared is the opposing force to take us on? So that's pretty, that's pretty sort of the basic blocking and tackling of, of, of trying to figure out whether you're strong enough. Second, uh, second, uh, second metric. This force should be able to fight with reasonable chances of success, that enemy force that it may encounter at, at a place where I am trying to get my way. So there's an element of risk. I mean, that, that's partly a leadership thing. What it's, I mean, what's the, uh, I mean what's, the, what's, the, what's the risk tolerance of the fleet commander or, or his superiors or her superiors? So there's, so there's an element of that. Uh, it, can, it can bring higher leadership into it. Uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz uh, famously did, did, did his job by what he called the principle of calculated risk. Do unto the others, do, do unto the adversary if you think you can do unto him worse than he can do unto you. So he's trying, he's, he's trying to figure, he's trying to get his fleet commanders in that, in, in, in thinking about risk in terms of inflicting and taking damage. But uh, so that's one way to, to, to uh, think about this particular metric. But to, to me, this is, the most, uh, this is the most interesting aspect of it. Likely, what is the largest enemy force I am likely to encounter at some place that I am trying to win a battle? And that's really, I mean, that's really interesting. And because, I mean, it's, it's basically a matter of geopolitical analysis. Knowing the adversary, what does the adversary want in a particular theater? How many, how many forces is it likely to assign to defend its commitment in that theater? How much of its navy is it going to send? How much of its air force is it going to assign? Or, or in the case of uh, China, uh, the PLA rocket force. And that's a, that's a, that's a, matter, of, uh, that's, that's a matter of estimating, estimating how much it wants its goals there. Kozovitz would tell us that determines how much resources they spend on it and for how long. So, so again, there's an element of, uh, of human desire there. What's the, so what's the, what's, what's the value of the object, the political object, strategic objects, and how much do you spend to get it? That, that gives you a way to, to estimate the fraction of my enemy's forces that you will encounter at a particular time and place of action. And that's just a, that's just a really uh, difficult thing to do. But nonetheless, I think uh, Mahan is demanding it of us, and I, and I agree with him on this. I mean, if you think, if you think about it from uh, his standpoint, he was, he was worrying about making the United States stronger, principally in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, where the, uh, where, where the sea lanes running to the Panama Canal would ultimately run. He was, looking, he was looking at a potential adversary such as Britain's Royal Navy, and he was trying to, he was trying to estimate how big, the US, uh, the, how, how big the U.S. fleet needed to be in order to defend those waters. And he said, well, yeah, Britain's got a huge fleet. It's full of battleships and cruisers and whatnot, but Britain also presides over an empire on which the sun never sets, and it has to, uh, it has to guard the sea lanes. It has to guard, guard many theaters. And he, so, so, he, so he sort of ran this, he sort of ran this, uh, this analysis, and he said, look, Britain probably is not going to send more than 20 capital ships into our backyard, no matter, no matter what it's trying to do in the Caribbean Sea. And therefore, that became the benchmark for the size of the U.S. fleet. And indeed, I showed a picture of the Great White Fleet. That, that, that fleet was made up of 20 battleships. 16 went on the voyage, four were in maintenance. But, uh, but again, he got, to see his, I, he got to see this kind of thinking translated into steel, which, uh, which I can tell you is kind of a cool thing as a scholar, which, which of course Mahan was. So just, just to wrap things up, so it's just some things, some ways to think about trying to wage away games vic to, uh, to victory in a fellow superpower's backyard. Who wants it more? Who's going to assign more for a greater share of their forces? Again, that's the, that's the benchmark uh, for what we need in order to get our way. Can you do, do the net assessment stuff? Think about, uh, think about uh, costs and opportunity costs of various courses of action. And think about, think about risk. What's our risk tolerance? How much risk are we running? Not only, not only directly to the force, but to our standing in the world as well. 
I mean, for example, if we were to put the U.S. Pacific fleet into, in, into the Western Pacific and lose a large, a, a large chunk of it in an afternoon or in a short period of time, the United States is a maritime nation. If we lose a lot of that sea power, at that point, we, we will probably see our standing in the world knocked down simply because we don't have the, the assets, for, at least for a time, in order to defend that status. So, this is, and this is where I'll leave you. Who, who wins when a fraction of U.S. forces goes up against most, most or all of, of a, a, an, an enemy joint force, Navy backed up by shore-based shore defenses, and, and, all, and the, the missile forces, all the, all the variety of missile forces that I, that I catalog with you th this evening. And I think that's an open question. I think that's, I think that's what we're trying to game out and figure out here at the War College and think, and think tanks around the country and, and so forth. But the point I would leave you with is just be, be, be very careful about uh, too confident takes on, on, the, on the size, capacity of naval forces and the relative balance in the Western Pacific and elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific. And with that, I will, uh, I will close with these two young ladies and uh, take any questions that you would like to pose. Please uh, stay up here, Jim. I, I think that's probably the best 45 minutes that I've spent in, uh, in the past year, and it really gives you a lot to think about. Not all good news, obviously, but something we all ought to be thinking about. So uh, let's do some questions. Uh, if anybody in the audience has a question, please uh, use the microphone and the uh, chair back in front of you and just identify yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Please. And Lieutenant Commander Park from South Korea. Oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your good uh, lecture. Um, very appreciated. Uh, I want to ask about the Chinese fishing boat you mentioned in the lecture. Um, uh, my question is: um, Is there any strategy about the Chinese fishing boat? Fishing boat and define these Chinese fishing boat uh, because in East China Sea, um, especially about the uh, boundary of uh, uh, Korea, South Korea. There are too many, too, too, too many Chinese fishing boats that it is very hard to navigate in, on the sea. And when I uh, crossed the South China Sea, there was also too many Chinese fishing boats. And I think this is kind of a Chinese strategy uh, to expand their uh, neighbor forces to other countries and other seas. And recently, I read, uh, read the, um, some articles and newspaper that the, even the Chinese fishing boat appears on the Latin America seas. So yep. um, if China um, have a strategy to expand their neighbor ports to the US, I think it's going to be the fishing boat will be the first. So the the crews on the fishing boat are civilians, so it is very hard to define their um, kind of position. Will they, uh, we have, do we have to consider them as a soldier or do we have to consider them as a civilian? So it can be a quite hard to deal with. So is there any strategy or um, is there any definition for about the Chinese fishing boat in the U.S.? Yeah, it's a great game. I, I blew past that pretty, pretty fast, as you noted, just simply because I didn't want this, to, this uh, talk to expand without bounds, which it, might have, which it might have done. Just the long story short, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, I mean the, China, the Chinese fishing fleet with the maritime militia, uh, I mean, I, I would, they're doing what we call in the sports arena here in the United States, flooding the zone. I mean, that, that, gives, that gives China the ability to, to uh, uh, put large numbers of assets, even if, un even if uh, unarmed assets, into waters that it wants to claim at its own. What China is doing in the South China Sea er ever since 2009, but really, really in, in some ways for over a century, even before communist China, has been claiming uh, what they call indisputable sovereignty in the South China Sea. I'm sure you all, you've all seen that nine or 10 dashed uh, line enclosing the vast majority of the South, the South China Sea, including the east coast of Taiwan. And sovereignty, if you study international relations, on day one, the very first day of uh, International Relations 101, uh, your professor will tell you that sovereignty is a monopoly of force, a monopoly of force within certain lines on the map that we call uh, borders. 
So basically, so basically whoever commands that monopoly of force makes the rules. And I mean, this is something that this is, we, we, we thought until the 1980s that we had uh, settled the question of whether coastal states can own the sea. And I mean, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, codifies that and it says no, that's why it assigns territorial seas, contiguous zones and exclusive economic zones to, to coastal states is to make that point. No one owns the sea. But yet uh, China, China and, and also Iran and also Russia to a degree in the Arctic are, are, have now reopened that question. And the, fi the, fishing fleet is, uh, the fishing fleet is one way of getting presence in there if, you, if you're China. I think, that, I think the way to look at it, to look at the problem is to uh, think about the fishing fleet, as I said, it's the vanguard of Chinese sea power. The Coast Guard, if you, if you want to claim sovereignty, I mean, if you want to claim that your laws apply on, on sovereign territory, including at sea, go ahead and start policing them, using law enforcement forces as your primary instrument to safeguard what you want to look like as, a, as legitimate commercial activity. And then beyond that, to, to backstop that, if someone, someone effectively defies the China Coast Guard and the maritime militia, then you have the Navy, then you have shore-based forces to back that up. So it's a, it's a very dense and layer, layered uh, strategy that China, uh, China has assembled. And no, no, Asian, no East Asian power can actually outmatch that, especially in the South China Sea. And I think that's, I mean, that's a big problem that we're, that we're grappling with. If you want to do some more reading on this, uh, a couple of years ago I led off a series, uh, a series down at the Naval Institute uh, uh, proceedings called the Maritime Counterinsurgent, the Mar Maritime Counterinsurgency uh, Project, which is basically making the case that in a, in a sense, China, is, is, is use, China, a state actor, is waging an insurgency against the international legal order of the law of the sea in places like the South China Sea. And uh, so, so you can, uh, uh, so, so you can uh, check, check those out. My case, my case uh, that I made was, yeah, if you're the United States and if you want to support your allies and defend freedom of the sea, the international legal order, you got to be there. We're, we're really not there on a 24-7, 365 uh, basis in places on the South China Sea. We do some pretty impressive, impressive uh, exercises and whatnot, but we come and we go, and then guess who, who we leave in charge of that uh, geographic space? China's always there. It's a really tough. Uh, it's a really tough strategy to beat. So, but we are we are trying to uh, we are trying to to get with it. And I know that, I know that you all have territorial uh, uh, issues in your area as well. So I'm sure that uh, I'm sure you're seeing it as well. Very Other questions, questions here in the room. Answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. Though. Other questions here in the room. We've got a, a Zoom question here, Jim. Uh, wouldn't our Navy be able to shut down the Malacca Straits and starve China of fuel and food? Yeah, the Chinese, the Chinese worry about that. Uh, in fact, they all the way back to the days of Hu Jintao, but uh, before uh, uh, before Xi, Xi Jinping, he called this his Malacca dilemma. And uh, I mean, I guess in the like I said, the Chinese do worry about that. But uh, there are a lot of practical difficulties. I mean, you can you can you can actually clog up the, the Malacca Strait. But I mean, there's so, there are certain realities about shipping in the shipping in the modern world that re that make it much harder to do a distant blockade than in say. The, uh, the First World War, when when the Royal Navy basically uh, barred uh, Imperial Germany from the from the from the Atlantic across the uh, across the Orkneys, the the northern UK and uh, Norway Gap, and then across the uh, uh, the English Channel. So, I mean, today cargoes can be sold multiple times en route. That makes it really that makes it really hard to determine even who owns a particular cargo. So. There's a lot, there was a lot of talk about back in the 2006, 2007 time, uh, time frame here at the War College and elsewhere, and elsewhere in the naval community about about a blockade, but that, that's that's pretty that's pretty much quieted down. I haven't heard anybody talk about doing that uh, for a long time. Having said that, if you if you widen the, if you widen the aperture from the Malacca Strait and look all along the first island chain, the uh, You'll, you'll, notice, well, you'll notice two things. The first island chain, which runs from Japan all the way down to, uh, to, through Taiwan and the Philippines, encloses the entire Chinese coastline. No Chinese seaport outflanks it. And the, the island chain belongs entirely to, uh, to US, allies, US allies, partners, and friends. Some of them are very well armed and, and also host to US forces. This is, this is the implement of a closer end blockade, or at least it could be if our allies and we, we agreed to, to make it so, which is one reason the Marine Corps has reinvented itself as, a, uh, as an island defense force, basically to put, basically to put uh, small bodies of, uh, of Marines on the islands armed with anti-ship sensors and anti-ship weapons, able to close those straight in between the, island, in, in between the islands to Chinese merchant and, and naval shipping uh, if we get in a fight with them. So they, and the US Army's uh, thinking in, in very similar terms as well. We had, uh, 
We had General Charlie Flynn here a couple of, a couple of months ago, and he, he was talking in very similar terms as well, thinking about the, the U.S. Army also as a sea service and, uh, and, and, a, and a means of controlling, controlling access to the Pacific and also supporting the fleet. So it's, good to, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to see the jointness actually happen. The Air Force is getting into the game too. Well, I'd just like to comment that uh, we have almost 100 participants on Zoom in addition to who we have here in the audience, and we will be posting this on YouTube. So if anyone you know of would be interested and didn't get the opportunity today, that will be made available to you. So, Dr. Holmes, thank you very much. Thanks, Captain Jay. Thank you, everybody.